Welcome back to the Tempo Podcast. Now, today I am with a guest I'm excited to talk with you about because he's held a lot of the roles that I would like to hold in the future of my career. So I think I'm going to learn quite a lot today, which is always good. It always means I'm going to ask some really tough questions, which I know people enjoy watching. So with me today is Zach Miller, the Vanilla Soft Zero. How are you, Zach? I'm doing well. Doing well. Thanks for having me. Um, if you see me squirming, it's partially because of the tough questions, partially because my back's killing me right now. So you know, don't don't misinterpret that. That you know, you, questions are too uh, too deep. You can tell me when it's one yeah. and tell me when it's the other. Okay, well, I'm, I'm aiming for fifty fifty. Hopefully, that's like quite a lot of bad questions, but we'll see how we go. Right on. Right on. So right off the bat, um, I said I said obviously a second ago, you're our CRO. How long is it that you've been here now? Gosh, I'm. It's still pretty, still pretty short tenure. Um, I guess uh, we're coming up on the end of April, so it'll be five. I call it five months. Five months. Okay. In, end of November, of December. Round it to six by the time of publication. That's a lovely little window to look back on. Perfect. So, yeah. um, walk me through now. Tell me what you think is the most interesting here. Your what is your usual routine in your job? So it could be on a weekly basis. You usually have a set number of things that you have to do, and a set number of meetings you have, or maybe it's per month, that sort of thing. I'm thinking of maybe pipeline reviews, mm -hmm. board meeting. Maybe you hire a person on a regular on regular cadence. What mm -hmm. sort of stuff does a person in your shoes have to do? Yeah, it's um, I mean a lot of pretty standard mundane mundane stuff like. Um, you obviously one on ones with my direct reports as well as with uh with CEO each week. Um uh we've got a you know we've got a revenue cadence that we follow, which I think is is pretty important um to get everybody in sort of a rhythm of of thinking about their business in, in various different ways. So we do a we do a weekly pipeline review slash forecast call where um we sort of review um different time horizon windows and sort of inspect the deals through different lenses and, and the forecast through different lenses there and sort of like a rotating basis. So, uh, you know, like the first week of the month is, is usually the full quarter. The second week of the month is the current month. The third week of the month is two quarters or like one quarter out. So this quarter plus, you know, whatever the, the next quarter. And then the last one is sort of confirming the month and the, the rest of the quarter. So we sort of take this this uh, expanding, contracting view to make sure that we don't have you know, surprises around the corner, stuff like that. Um, we do a weekly sales all hands, which is primarily t two things. We um, so I run that each week, and it's um, you know it's partially a celebration of of you know what everybody did this week. We kind of you know. People added some great deals to the pipeline. They get to care about that. If they close some deals, everybody kind of goes through and kind of reads off what they've closed for the week. And it just kind of keeps everybody focused, puts a nice bookend at the end of the week. Um, we do a weekly call where we bring together all the sales team as well as the functional leaders from different parts of the organization. So um, from uh, product, from uh, uh, services, from uh marketing and we basically review any of the big deals where we've got um, asks from the organization right so uh we've got a deal that's really important over here and we need a sale we need an asset from marketing that's a you know a case study in a certain industry right or we've got um uh we've got a big deal in uh over here that that needs it's got a couple product requests you know, and how do we how do we work through those? So we do that on a cadence each week, and that serves to give sort of a feed, it, two things. It, it helps us win big deals. It also serves as a feedback loop to the other parts of the organization to to sort of help guide, you know, where they might be thinking uh, by the forcing function of individual deals, right? Like what needs to be developed? Are we seeing patterns? Different things like that. Um, then I I'm doing uh, I try to do skip levels with. Um, and this this kind of um, uh, I think is an interesting thing. I always want to make sure that I'm I'm you know giving you know everybody in my organization um, you know the the support that they need, whether it's my direct man, uh, my direct uh, reports, or or the folks reporting to them, or or 
you know, depending on the size of the org right now, it's that's that's kind of the the, the layers. But um, you know, certainly in the past, you know, where that might be several several layers deep there, um, which I think is also it's really important to I think support support those folks and and um, you know I'm always happy to do whatever I can. I think it's also important for them to feel like they've got the ear of the the leader of the org, right? So I think that's um, I think that's meaningful. Um, and so yeah, it tends to be kind of a week to week focus, and then um, you know layering on top of that, I've, I've, I've usually got a board sync every couple of weeks where we kind of update the board on the pipeline and what's going on. Um, you know, like you said, certainly there's recruiting activities. I'd say that that anybody in my role, that's the that's kind of the make or break is your ability to get really great people around you, right? Then you know it's it's difficult to you know it, it is really difficult to control um you know every aspect of everything that's going on so you have to really get good people around you so i think that recruiting piece is important right now we're at a, we're not at a stage where we're like religiously bringing people on on a um you know any sort of a, a cadence per se but just both you know as the business can support it and also opportunistically if there's somebody out there in the market where we think we can grab them we'll grab them um and then uh and then quarterly, you know, we've got, we'll do sort of a, either sort of a QBR slash SKO each quarter where we review what we did uh, and look forward to the next quarter. And then, um, and then more like annual slash semi-annual, I'd say like true SKO. So we actually just had our first SKO in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was great to get everybody in the same place and, uh, um, you know, work on some skills, work on some, um, uh, some process stuff, some sk sales skills stuff, some product stuff. So it was it was really meaningful. I think as much as anything, just to have everybody in the same place. So, you know, there's a there's a certain cadence to that as well, though it's certainly, um, you know, broader. And then I'd say you layer on top of that sort of the, the strategic planning that happens with the the various other, um, you know, functions in the business and the you know executive team of the business to sort of make sure that everything's sort of going in the the direction that we want it to go and so that can happen you know both i'd say a little bit on a weekly basis but then um you know sort of big themes will take over and you know that might be a series of things that, that happen in a, in a weekly or monthly basis but um yeah all that comes together to be a pretty packed pretty packed schedule um and then you know on top of that obviously i'm i try to be in actual deals as much as i can like that's that's actually the part of this job that I love the most is actually saddling up next to reps and managers and SEs and helping them get deals closed. Um, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, just adding a, you know, adding a wizened old graying bald head to a meeting, uh, which helps sometimes, you know, or a title or, or, you know, sometimes there's, uh, um, you know, travel and, and whatnot needs to happen. So, again, yeah, that's, that's kind of my favorite part. I would hazard a guess you're on Zoom for a, a massive proportion of your day. How many Zoom calls do you say would you have a day? <laughs> um, I would say that the average is somewhere seven or eight. Um, I, I actually, charitably, it's it's kind of nice. I'm I'm working on the West Coast, right? And um, and the the team is uh, is very kind about not scheduling too many things before eight a.m. for me. So I tend to have a bit of a of uh, of open space in the afternoons where I can actually you know think a little bit where you know my afternoons don't get booked solid but uh, but the mornings certainly are and um, yeah like you said a lot of time on Zoom a lot of time um, you know talking to you know talking to two dimensional sets of uh, shoulders and ears and eyes right so. Mm, I enjoy the opposite with with the time difference my mornings no one bothers me. It's yeah. lovely to get on with that deep work type session. Yep. And then in my afternoons, I don't do anything because I'm normally talking to people, which yep. Um, yep, exactly. is, is still the same type of thing. So I know I know what you feel like there. So you yep. definitely prefer to be not in the weeds is kind of one way of saying it, but you your like gut feel, if you could do a little bit more of anything, it would probably be that sat in the Zoom, sat in the sales calls with people, sat in the demos, the negotiations, the getting this over the line. You like to sit there as much as you can absolutely absolutely um you know and you know certainly where appropriate right like i you know i'm not trying to sit in on first 
you know, first calls and, you know, over help over engineer, over inspect or anything, but like, you know, as deals pick up, it's, it's really fun to be in. Um, yeah. Coach, coaching, a coaching, a struggling rep or helping an amazing rep get to the next level one-on-one -on -one or, you know, helping the team close deals is that's really the, that's really the fun part of the job for sure. Hmm. Yeah. And I imagine the bigger a company gets, the less you get to do that because there's more middle managers, more uh, leadership layers, which can do that. Y yes. And, yes. And no. I mean, I think, um, I think good, good sales and revenue leaders stay like um, prioritize that and force themselves to stay involved. Now, certainly they're involved in, in a much smaller portion of the deals, proportion of the deals, right? But um, it, it does actually become fun because you get to be involved in like, you know, more and more of the fun deals and the, the really interesting deals, right? But um, yeah, I, I would say that, that that's been a theme across my my whole leadership career has been, um, yeah, I'm I'm always in a I'm always in a bunch of deals, and so it's um, now, now that said, there there certainly are more demands on your time as you get up and up. But I think if you prioritize that and prioritize the individual interaction with with reps, um, you know, it's like the old, you know, big rock, uh, pebble, sand water demonstration if you, if you prioritize the important things you can still get them to happen and all the other stuff will kind of fit in the, the nooks and crannies between that you said big rock is quite interesting i was just about to ask there's um the way that you said that you do the weekly kind of cadence and then there's uh, obviously end of month and then the quarter kind of goes with the sales function that's how they live but yeah. do you um do you subscribe to any of those kind of ways of working there's um eos i think is one i, I can't recall what that stands for but there's like that's kind of following an, uh, a scrum style approach to the mm -hmm. rhythms that you work for. Is there something that you kind of subscribe to there or just kind of habits that you've formed that have lasted? I mean, I'd say it's mostly habits that I've formed over the years, but like I, I did at one point pretty early on in my, in my career, take a, uh, <clears throat> take a time management course from, it was funny. It was, it was a Franklin Covey time management course. And I can't remember. It was something about you know uh, accomplishing the important things, and um, it, it was. I mean, this is this is this is going to date me, right? But this was back when you know before Google Calendar and and stuff. I guess Outlook was a thing, but pretty much everybody in the professional world still used paper diaries, right? Like eight by twelve with you know. It, it looked like a Google calendar, but you actually had to write with these things called pencils or pens in them. And so, you know, it was, and, and Franklin Covey was a seller of these things. And so, you know, it was basically this full day course on how to, how to utilize this tool to make sure that you accomplish the different things that are important to you. And um, the, 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 the two things that really stuck with me there was the sort of quadrant, uh, um, you know, thinking of things in a quadrant of uh, importance and urgency, right? And that, like, you know, the 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 line of the quadrant being everything above this line is is important. Below it is not. And then, you know, the right and left is like to the to the right is urgent, and to the I'm sorry, to is it, uh, yeah, yeah that'd be it. Urgent, yeah, that would be not important. important. And you're trying to you're trying to put do as many things that are important and not urgent because those tend to be the things that are big and important, right? Um, and that over time, if you don't do them, they're easy to procrastinate. But if you don't do them, you end up not achieving what you're trying to achieve. Um, obviously, important, urgent things you just got to deal with. But trying to spend as little time on on the things that are urgent and unimportant, right? The things that sort of disguise themselves as 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 urgent and important that really aren't. And so, um, you know, the, the, the tyranny of the urgent, I think is, is a real thing. And, and in today's world of, you know, alerts firing at you from 17 different communications apps all at the same time. And, you know, looking down and getting anxiety by how many unread emails you might have, um, those, those things are real, right? So if you can, so if you can stick with doing things that are important and, and, and not necessarily things that are just urgent. That's that's one thing. And then the other was the the idea of big rock, like scheduling the things 
and blocking them out on your calendar and holding yourself accountable, hold, holding yourself accountable to that and doing those things and then knowing that the other stuff will, you know, that has to get done will get done. I got uh, called out quite heavily yesterday from uh, from a group that I'm part of to but it's kind of an educational peer group and uh, one of the guys in it was a uh, calendaring productivity efficiency expert he did this session and uh i did think oh god yeah like I i'm not good enough with my calendar so for instance the start of my day i don't have a start of the day kickoff which i could well do and then even late last night i i realized that i didn't do a roundup finishing of the day kickoff uh kickoff summative call or summative mm -hmm. sit down for a few minutes yeah. so at 2 a.m i was doing that in my head i couldn't sleep so mm -hmm. that's not good. Then my lunch, I didn't book time for my lunch. I had yep. it, but it wasn't when I wanted it to be. And then it yep. was later and I rushed it. All of that sort of thing makes a big difference, I think, as well. But equally, like you said, if you're not achieving something that you want to work on in the next couple of weeks, if it isn't there in my diary, I don't do it. Yep. That will take exactly the precedence because they're the only thing I can't not be there for live. You know, but everything else yep. can work around that. So if I haven't got, let's say I want to book 10 really high profile guests for this podcast if that's my big rock and it isn't on my calendar very prevalently it is not going to happen so i'm a bit guilty personally of going oh i know i've got to do that it's on my list i'll get to it but like you say and yeah. i can tell you've done that a couple of times the way you reacted to that one. Oh yeah for sure for sure it, it, it's you know it's it's inevitable that's sort of the way things happen it, it's funny i i was talking to um actually talking to to, to manager about i uh, struggling to get his his aes to uh to get outbound prospecting going right and um you know i i we, we talked about kind of this point and and actually shared with him something that was interesting from my past that i that was it was i i in at the time felt very oppressive but in reality in hindsight is really was really a gift and um you know we had a ceo who basically said okay there's these prospecting hours that are going to go on your calendar between X time and Y time, this date and this date. And I own you during those times. Like if like you need to be prospecting, you know, email off, et cetera. And, um, you know, if, if you get an, if you lose a deal because you didn't respond to an email that happened in these times because you were doing your outbound, then that's fine. You can, you can blame me, right? You can blame the, the CEO. There's, literally nothing that can happen between these times that can't be responded to after it's over and it's like this one he said it was like church time like i like you're in that pew during that time and other than that time's your own you can work your schedules around it but that's that's my time i own you during that time you need to be doing this right which again felt kind of oppressive at the time but then it also was like a gift it's like mm -hmm. like enforced the big rock enforced from above right where you know, you didn't have to worry about procrastinating the the calls that you needed to make because it was just right there in your calendar, right? You didn't have to, because that's always the first thing that goes. Like if it's your scheduling 10 high profile things, it's like, oh, well, I got to get this thing done. What can I move around? Oh, uh, I could I could do this scheduling. I can do that tomorrow. And you move it. It's easier now even with, with electronic calendars because you can just drag and drop that task over to someplace else, right? You didn't even have to you didn't have to erase it on your on your diary and actually rewrite it someplace else right so that procrastination of the important thing is so easy to do that that when it's when it's sort of enforced from above right it it is counterintuitively freeing because now you know you don't have to worry about procrastinating that thing so it, anyway it's kind of an interesting dynamic but um yeah and i would i'd also say from that standpoint like if you like don't forget about like you know you mentioned lunch right like these like today's day and age when we're working from home on zoom and like we're kind of scheduled bell to bell like don't forget to block your lunch don't forget to put your workouts in don't forget to take care of yourself because I, I think i think we learned that during pandemic initially that like you could you know you could work 24 hours a day if you wanted to now like you don't have to go into the office and so that means yeah you don't have to go to the office but you could work all the time so put your workouts in put your you know put dinner with your family on the calendar so that you know you don't bleed into that sort of thing so i don't know these are all uh, amateur 
uh, I'm sure your guy yesterday was much more detailed on on the time management stuff, but yeah, details of it, the, the the random thoughts of the amateur time management philosopher here. So. There's a lot you can do. Like even my Google Calendar, I I live in it in my personal Gmail too. If I I need to take the trash out, whatever. If it's not on there, I don't do that. So that's yeah. like a certain color I have and all these things. It gets yeah. a little bit OCD, I'll admit. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, if it makes me do it, I don't care. But um, yeah, no, but phone alarms are another, right? Like I've, they got, I've got literally a, a phone alarm that says, uh, "Put the trash, the trash to the curb Tuesday mornings." Otherwise, I just won't do it. Exactly. Yeah, and that, that's the point of it. But, yeah. anyways, um, I wanted to ask you um a couple of things about what it's like to have the, not necessarily the number of people that report to you because i know there'll be several team leads and so on with uh, a number of ic's within and, and those types of things it could quickly become quite a big number but um has there been a time in your career like, like as you get promoted and so on and you start to manage and be re responsible for or, or accountable for a larger number of people and maybe a penny's dropped where you've gone oh okay so now you know i was managing a team of three or four and I can deal with that three or four people in front of you is not a big deal. And now it's 15 or now it's 21 and now it's 35 and now it's 50. That can quickly get quite daunting. Imagine public speaking to three people and then 50 really, really different. Yeah. Um, when you put together there's their work being done well or just being done period. And then there's all of the income and the salary and so on, the performance, the management of all of that, lots of different things becomes quite snowballing there if you see what i'm saying and there's also as well what i'd love to hear from you my slack big driver of anxiety when it's above the nine plus messages on red oh i hate it absolutely hate it i don't yeah. care about my inbox that's fine yeah. i i stay at inbox zero because i i have that kind of person that that's part of me and maybe yeah. when i get to a high level i'll just be overwhelmed by too much that i won't but right. that yeah. amount of people that come to you I may need you to be involved in things or to see things or just be in a loop and that's mm -hmm. when that number of slack unreads or emails goes crazy mm -hmm. what is mm -hmm. that like to live with and deal with I, I imagine you get used to it but what's it like when you don't um well I, so i i think in in general it becomes important to have um processes and and by processes, I don't, I, you know, I it's kind of an over, I think an overused term, but like you, you know, you know, when you ask me about the calendar and the things we're doing, like the, you know, it's we, we sort of have we sort of have a um when you can set it up so that you've got a, either a weekly flow or a monthly flow around the way those things work, and you make sure that you've got um whether it's whether it's meetings or check-ins or, or or various things on the calendar to review different stuff then you can kind of make sure that you're covering the, the full span that you want to cover from a you know, i hesitate to say control because really as as the organization gets bigger and bigger in in actuality the control you know the, the control that i would have over that larger organization is probably less right because um simply just can't be in, in all places at all times and can't have, it's very difficult to set up a, a, a rigorous enough, you know, set of guardrails to make sure that everybody is doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing at, at the right time. And it's funny because I think, I think this has even become much more difficult um, in the, in the remote work world compared to the, the old sort of in-person world, right? Like in, in the in-person world, you know, if I had, you know, 10 sales offices around the country, I could just literally pop in and inspect them from time to time and make sure that things were going the way that I wanted them to go, right? But that doesn't really work anymore. And, and I think I, I think that there's a lot of that is actually driving some of the anxiety of trying to, you know, where some companies are really trying to force people back into the office and losing, right? Um, and so I think there's there's some element of of control that people are grasping for that they can't necessarily get. Right. But I think if you've got if, so one is like having those good, you know, processes and 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 sort of um, I would say meeting cadences, although, you know, certainly don't want to have too many meetings, but those those sort of meeting cadences that that cover the things that, you know, you need to get covered. Um, and then I alluded to it earlier that like it is really, really important that you've got people that you can 
that you can um, really trust to execute against the things that 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 you hire them to do, right? And so um, I I really love a, a concept that um, it comes actually from the military, but it's um, it's uh, it's a, a I think it's a I don't know if it's if it's um, NATO or U.S. military doctrine that talks about commander's intent, right? And and the idea is that if like if I can be very very clear with both my direct team and and the organization overall about what the big picture objectives are that we're trying to achieve, right? And they know that that and then and then empower people at, at each different level to achieve that thing. Not necessarily to do exactly the steps A, B, C, D, E, and F, which I think are the things that are going to lead to that result. So I'm going to suggest these, but you've got with my with commander's intent, you've got the ability and degrees of freedom to improvise in the situation, right? If you're in, if you know if you're in the UK and having a meeting in the middle of the night, like you you you're not going to be able to wake me up and ask me a question on how you should do this or do that. Like you need to probably just be able to execute against it, and you know knowing that that you've got that um, that clear picture of what we're trying to accomplish together in mind and that you you've got the the ability to um, to improvise and react in the situation I think is also um, sort of a key theme to to weave into to an organization like like especially a sales organization because you know um, things happen quickly in the field and you know reps and managers and SEs and folks have to be able to react and, and can't run every decision up the up the flagpole right yeah i mean yeah sales is kind of the anomaly a little bit with that for, yeah for the most part as you said but um beyond that i, I do think that's um we're getting better at it across the board i, I don't mean uh, it within vanilla soft at all with this but a lot of the work from home stuff i worked in an office in one job i was hybrid for one for other years but they were far away so i was remote fully then covid came along turned everybody upside down not me because i've been used to it yeah, been doing it. yeah. yeah I, I was kind of fortunate for that but the thing i did notice is the the digital communication went completely crazy the slack overflow Holy the email God. overflow got way too bad I, I realized you know we're learning on on the job a little bit with this stuff for the most part but the as you say keeping a cap on the number of meetings having the appropriate amount difficult balance to strike you're either there's no perfect so you're either too little or too much yeah everybody yeah. has their own personal preference on that too i like fewer because i need more time to think about stuff type of yeah. person i am yeah. but some people need to be meeting with people all the time gives them energy yeah so yep. it's, it's very it was interesting right because it, it, it's almost like people needed to prove they were working so they started sending you know gazillion slacks to everyone mm -hmm. right and um, I think that that you know again in, in and I think we actually on on the on the spectrum of things that I've experienced I think we actually do a pretty good job of this that, that like um, uh, I've I've certainly seen it more uh, you know more volume but like um, I, I think we're pretty good from my perspective about you know communicating when you communicate and then and then putting the um, you know, some flexibility back in people's lives to to execute against what they need to execute to do their job. You know, if you're just in meetings all the time and and responding to slacks all the time about the work that you're supposed to be doing, then you're actually not doing that work. You're just responding to the, the slacks and the, the meetings about the work, right? So exactly that. Yeah. I always used to think free space in my calendar was bad. It actually means I'm doing stuff. And if I don't have any free space, I'm not doing anything. Yeah. So yeah. there's uh so there's that. Anyways, um I want to move us on. So as a CRO, you probably talk to CS, the, mm -hmm. the versions of the two CS that there is. Obviously, you're going to talk to a sales team and a marketing team, most yeah. likely, pretty much any company. Now, I know um, you've held a lot of different ti uh, titles across the revenue leadership side across a bunch of different companies. But when you've seen sales and marketing in particular work well together, what has it been that you've noticed which has enabled that? It's one of those things in every company there's different things that contribute to it not being great but in some places it just really works and uh, I'd, I'd just love to know when you've seen that you know what were the processes what were the things that happened what were the things that maybe didn't happen which allowed that to flourish um that's a i think it's a, it's a really good question and it's it's um 
you know, it's certainly not it's certainly not an easy one. So this is this is me squirming for the question. I'm going to blame it on my back. But um, the um, I would say well from a, from a big picture when I've seen it work really well together, it's because both teams are are measured against against targets that matter to both, right? Um, and so I think that there's a, there's the temptation, you know, uh, you know, for instance, like, uh, you know, website clicks and impressions are important to marketing, right? Because, because, you know, marketing needs to know those things and manage those things ultimately to bring, you know, um, you know, revenue into the down the funnel, right? Um, but you know, website clicks and impressions and things like that are not something that that um, you know really impacts the the the, the uh, income statement, right? Like it's 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 revenue and there's costs, right? So I guess it maybe it's costs, but ultimately, like if if you're measured against KPIs that are meaningful and are global in scale and that impact the business, like pipeline, right? Like the 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 pipeline that that uh, is created through marketing efforts, right? The revenue that's created. So if everybody's sort of hitting on the big picture, sort of global. Uh, KPIs that matter to the business, then they tend to, in my experience, work well together. When they're focused on things that are really in their own um, world more. Um, so if you know if, if marketing's, uh, you know, again like really really concerned with, um, you know, things that that don't seem to resonate with sales and can be maximized without maximizing the revenue numbers then i think things kind of get out of get out of whack um i think I, i've been pretty lucky in that in in um in all of my career of b2b sales you know marketing within a b2b sales world um, or a company that is really you know selling b2b um, tends to be more aligned i think than marketing in um you know big consumer brand companies or things like that with the sales are right They're inherently marketing sort of is to is the um you know to kick up the demand and the awareness for sales to go out and find the deals that they want and execute against them right um and you know i think that that's so i've been blessed to be in in organizations where that's really the case but you know, certainly heard you know horror stories or or um, you know quips from you know sales colleagues in the past where yeah marketing what do I want marketing to do with their budget I want to I want them to cut their people and give me more budget to hire salespeople right but I've been really lucky to work in orgs that that you know the sales and marketing teams have really um, valued each other's contributions you know if the sales team understands how much impact the marketing teams have on you know, on their deals and on their ability to, to sell well, right? Um, and I guess the last thing I'd say is that um, when um, when when sales and marketing can really work together across the entire, not just the marketing funnel to bring things in to give to sales, but then across the entire sales pipeline, right? So it's not just seen as a lead gen, right, or a demand gen, but recognizing the influence that that marketing can have throughout the entire sales pipeline. So, you know, for instance, um, doing work, you know, out in the, you know, in the one to many world of marketing on trust and, you know, things that can help shorten sales cycles, right? Um, gosh, if, 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 if your brand is one that's really well trusted, then people aren't going to have to take as long in a sales cycle to vet you, right? And so your sales cycles are going to be shorter, which means you're going to have more more sales, right? If you if you if you increase the your your appearance of your confidence in the marketplace, your deals are going to get bigger. People aren't going to try to buy you know small little uh, sort of tester deals to see if it works, right? They they'll be confident to. That you're going to solve their problems and, and to you know to buy for a large population of of 
of the company, right? And so marketing can have huge impacts in the sales in the sales cycle, right? Shortening deals, increasing uh, deal sizes, uh, increasing win rates, um, and, and a lot of work that can be done across that pipeline can have a huge impact very directly on sales, as opposed to just being the the sort of you know the the, the lead gen mechanism. Good points. Yeah, I'll um I'll make a very quick comment before I move us on because I have a big topic I want to ask you before we yeah. finish up. But that does sound quite a bit like on a leadership and a leadership above those team leaders level. If mm -hmm. if I'm a CEO and I have two a uh, sales leader and a marketing leader and they're they're not like this that like people are also li are listening only, so I will have to explain that. But if the if the KPIs really don't line up, then how will it work? And if the KPIs are kind of close enough that there's obviously going to be some on either side that don't translate to the other one like you said the impressions of website visits but leading indicators and so on but that does sound in the primary i think what i got from what you said there is that the leader themselves if they're making their own kpis or the person who set them if they don't line up very well it's 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 physically impossible it's just it couldn't possibly work because yeah. i could I've, I've been in that shoes before um but we need to hit this goal and uh we're like you know in the, at the 11th hour we're not quite there but we're close we've got a way to do it i didn't believe in the way that was presented to me it could have mm -hmm. got us there we got there through other means that were valid mm -hmm. but the the plan b i didn't think would have made a blind bit of difference to a sales rep yeah that yeah. sort of thing can happen yeah. well, ultimately in the end like you know the, the there's the old saying that you know whatever you measure is what you're gonna get right whatever thing you measure is the output you're going to get from from whatever process you're doing so if you're measuring the right things and those things are the things that 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 are impactful to the ultimate success of the business right and and um you know again it's i don't know if it's maybe it's mqls maybe it's sqls maybe it's pipeline added maybe it's revenue sold i i don't know for any given company, the exact right set of things to measure, but they're the things that are impacted by both sales and marketing that will ultimately impact the you know the, the top line and then the, the bottom line of the of the business and the you know, the true sort of business metrics. Um, those are the things I think that are important to measure because those are the things that you'll get, and then everybody will. will will look at the lead indicators and tweak those to make sure that they achieve the, those those important those important metrics good stuff all right last topic and then i'm going to ask you about a mistake that you've made do some quick fire questions and then we're wrapping up you ready yeah 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 cool all right so hiring salespeople. we did talk about a little bit at the start i did want to dig into it but um i think this is a very interesting one so you'll have met through selling with and working with and hiring tons of salespeople in your career but hundreds if not in the thousands potentially yep. um they're all very good mostly at selling themselves Salespeople nearly always interview very well because if, if you can't do that well it's pretty difficult to sell a product that isn't you so yep. with that comes you know obviously not everyone is going to perform through various reasons their own or company context all these types of things and some people are going to be brilliant performers not everyone though so mm -hmm. across that spectrum what's your what's your gut check that you look for when you're interviewing somebody for a sales rep position of any kind is there something in particular that for instance i've heard sean on our team he used to love people who are trained in uh, I, I believe it's banks they used to get a very particular type of sales training at the big banks so that mm -hmm. would be something he's done he also is kind of sporty guy, so he would always look for some of the competitive background and not necessarily sports but it was usually that that would indicate that kind of motivational drive that they're going to have and that's very good for a salesperson is there something like that that you would normally look for yeah um and there's a few i i also like um i really like to hire people who have you know if, if i am well first off i would say i'll hire attitude enthusiasm and you know grit so I'll, I'll hire for personality traits above experience every time right like that's the most important thing is the is the individual and their potential versus their their background or what they've done 
And so that's the, that would say be sort of the underlying theme, right? But with that said, like the, the, the experience is so important, but it doesn't necessarily have to be from a specific, you know, X number of years at X type of company sort of thing. Now that said, when I have the opportunity to, to hire from companies that have great sales training organizations, which, you know, especially a company like ours, I, I hope to be one of those at some point in time, but today we don't have the staffing to, to do that or the, the, the scale to have a, you know, a fantastic, um, uh, you know, sales training organization. So, you know, some of the, some of the big, uh, some of the big companies do really amazing jobs. You know, ADP, for instance, is well known for having just a fantastic sales training, uh, uh, program. It used to be like before universities in the United States had actual sales programs, they, they called the companies like Xerox and ADP, um, you know, and IBM, you know, this was where you went to sales school. Right. That was like getting your 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 bachelor's degree in sales was was going and working for ADP for five years. Right. Um, I'm not just saying that because I've got ADP on my resume, but just they really it was really well known as, as that sort of an organization for a long time, along with Xerox, along with a few others. Um, so those, those the, you know, certainly that that's one element of it. But like you mentioned, um, I like to I've, I've had a ton of of success hiring people who've been in individual competitive sports. So not just competitive sports, but individual competitive sports that, and I would say individual competitive sports that, that require a level of, um, uh, I don't know, this is gonna sound bad, but pain tolerance, right? <laughs> like I can see how um, it translates for sure. Yeah, there's the yeah, like, like, you're on your own mentality. It's I'm gonna dig my way out. I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, all of that. Like, I'm gonna get up at 5 a.m. and go running in the morning uh, because I want to. I want to get a cross country scholarship. Uh, yeah, I, I hired a. I hired a woman at one point in time who had zero sales background. Um, she had been. Uh, but she, you know, she'd been like she'd been an admin for an executive at a at a at a company, and she'd done a few different things. But she wanted to get into sales. But the thing that was really interesting was she had she had started running cross country when she was like seven or eight years old. She started running with her dad, and she had this she had this goal that she was going to get a scholarship for cross country for running. Right? She grew up in the in the Midwest, and so she would get up at five a.m. when it was ten below, you know, ten below, and go running with her dad every morning through like junior high and high school because she was trying to get a scholarship. Ended up getting a scholarship. Ended up uh, running in college. But that sort of like that ability to to compete and to like like you know get up and be sort of accountable to doing the drudgery of day to day life to achieve something in the future is is um i guess a real indicator right and and so that's you know there there are certainly you know running isn't the only one you know but um you know individual sports i think tend to have an element of self-motivation and dedication towards something that that is um you know it's going to take some work and some effort to get to um and and um not that team sports are bad uh, you know certainly i was a i was a team sport guy but um you know, a lot of team sport stars, um, you know, the quarterback, you know, sometimes confuses, you know, his greatness with the fact that he had a great offensive line, you know, um, and, you know, so anyway, there's, that, that, that's, that's one element there. Um, and then, you know, again, if, if I'm hiring more senior sales within, so like entry level sales roles, I like to look for that sort of competitive, that, um, individual sports stuff um is senior senior level sales roles i i do like to look for you know consistent success in the past and that doesn't mean that that they've you know necessarily always been in the top 10 percent or something like that but somebody who's been successful and found a way to be successful and have some um some staying power at you know some uh, you know on in their background i think is is also important so um People who've been successful will generally find a way to be successful in the future. Good points. All right, we're almost at time, so I want to ask you for a very brief story and then uh, some quick fire questions, and then we're out of here. So, um, if something comes to mind, I'd like you to walk me through for a minute or two uh, a mistake that you've made, or at least a challenge that you faced, and something 
but you managed to turn around. So uh, to give you a couple of examples to get the brain moving on it while I talk, to give you a sec, maybe your top performers left, something like that could happen. Big deal that was almost a guarantee, didn't come in, managed to get it to come in. Um, those types of things I can imagine might have happened over the years. But um, what else comes to mind when I say that? Oh, man. Um... <clears throat> I mean, I can, I can think of, you know, a few, um, you know, like, uh, I'm thinking about a situation where, um, like, I, I don't know if, I don't know if this is one that I, that I, um, necessarily like did a great job of turning around, but it's maybe a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a lesson that, you know, um, maybe folks could learn from um perfect at, at, at you know at one point i uh i took over uh, a region of uh you know multiple sales offices and was really really successful in the first year like basically turned around a bunch of these offices that were really failing when i when i took them over and for whatever reason my my leadership style worked well with those offices and some, you know, we had some just really outstanding performances. And um, I very selflessly uh, promoted a bunch of people out of IC roles into leadership roles and from leadership roles out into actually even other other um, parts of the organization. And, um, you know, I think I I still am, I always have been and still am very focused on, you know, providing you know, career advancement and development and opportunities from the people who work for me who've been successful, right? Um, but I think it's certainly possible to um, to do too much of that at one time. And if you, if you if you promote people who are either maybe not quite ready to be promoted and then you know don't don't succeed at that next level, um, that's really that's really problematic, right? You're really doing that person a disservice. And and there's certainly some of that. And then um, you know, if if, uh, if you derail all of your performance because you've promoted all of, you know, everybody into a bunch of new jobs, right, then that is sort of, you, I mean, you, you, me telling the story, you probably know how it, how it ends, right? It did not end well. I could see that I, kind of, yeah. like, yeah. you know, yeah, the, so, the garden's got no no plants left in it type of thing. Yeah, They've exactly. all been moved up. Exactly. So. You, you've, you've eaten all your, you kind of eaten all of your, your, uh, your, your planting seed, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I think it's important to to measure your your, you know, your your desire to get people that you really care about to the next level with you know making sure that the machine is still running effectively, right? And and so what what I what I tried to do and ultimately burned myself out was, you know, it was like, well, geez, this things aren't working. So I I had to really, I had to myself dig in at levels that were really unsustainable, and I ended up kind of burning myself out. And, had to had to step back from stuff but um i don't know that was a it's also a very vague description there but hopefully there's some some themes that could i got you yeah good lesson learned but um yeah yeah, yeah a few things that play there so a few very quick questions then and then yeah. we'll wrap up so quick fires what would you say if you can remember what is the highest number of cold calls you've made in one given day probably 72 Five, maybe a hundred. I bet. I bet I've hit a hundred. Okay. In early days. I bet I hit a hundred. Hundred. Uh, what's the biggest deal that you personally? Could we say worked on or closed? What What's easier to come to mind there? What's the biggest deal you've closed? Probably the easiest one. Uh, so if I was part of the team that closed, I use like like, and like I said earlier, I'm, I I like to be involved in deals. Uh, call it two point two million um something that i closed myself and bear in mind i i i was only carrying a bag in the field you know through like 2005 but uh call it a quarter million i think a mil. and arr yeah so. arr lovely uh 100 being you're a legend and zero being you're not very good at all rate your cold email skills for me zero to 100 where would you be um 
70, 80. We call it 80. 80. And what about? Only because of, only because of great tools and, and uh, great blogs that I've uh, followed from other people. But Me too. What about cold calling? Where would you be on that? Uh, rusty, rusty for sure. But uh, I'd give myself a, I don't know, 75, uh, 75, 80. Okay. What about people management? That's that's probably my superpower. In fact, thinking about that, I probably give. If I probably back those up, those other two up to maybe sixty-five. I'd probably put my people management at, uh, I don't know, eighty-five, ninety. That's my. Okay. Cool. I'm, uh, I'm adjusting my notes. There we go. What time do you wake up in the morning? Six fifteen. 6.15, very specific. I like it. What did you want to do? Yeah, but my alarm goes off at 6.15. Ah. And, you know, we'll go with the alarm time start. because in theory you'll get up at the alarm time, but mine, not quite that story. Yeah. Um, second to last question, what did you want to be when you were a kid? What was that dream job when you were in school? Pie in the sky dream, what did you want it to be? I wanted to be a fighter pilot. Fighter pilot, very cool. Then I then then I grew too tall and was informed that I no longer would fit in the uh, the ejection seats. I'm six foot three. I don't think I'd have lasted too long in that either. It's yep. yeah, that would have been tricky. And last one, who do you think that you could recommend to come on the podcast for us that you wouldn't mind introducing? I know you've given me a bunch, but I'll put you on the spot again for it. Um. Gerard Green, the CMO at Vivin, and um, uh, Chris Trudeau uh, is a was the a head of BD and partnership stuff at High Spot, who's a, a super smart dude. Built a bunch of really cool things there. Uh, it's an area that I know, uh, admittedly, a little about, and might be cool to get on the show. Wonderful. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, last thing before we wrap up, where could people find and follow you if they wanted to ask a question or just connect? Uh, for sure. Uh, so on LinkedIn, Zachary Miller, I think it's just LinkedIn slash Zachary Miller. Uh, maybe Zachary A. Miller. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, you can find me at, at uh, the, the Vanilla Soft uh, LinkedIn page or just my own link page. Um, certainly email me if you are if you want to, Zachary.Miller at VanillaSoft.com. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, I respect the cold call. I'm going to give you my cell phone number, 602-531-3832. I respect the cold call. I'll, I'll answer sometimes. I'll always be nice. I won't always buy, but I'll sometimes answer. So, I respect giving it out. Not everyone's brave enough to do it because they know what will happen, but I respect the willingness to do it. Fair play. Right on. Cool. All right, sir. Well, thank you very much for your time. This was really good fun. And if you listen this far, congratulations. You have an excellent attention span. Well done. And with that, folks, thanks for listening. And we'll see you on the next one. Cheers, Ollie. Take care.